The war room felt exceedingly stuffy. It had been hours without a break, without so much as a drink of water. The commander in chief was surrounded by all of his most loyal and wise advisors. The prognosis was grim. A line with a potential enemy north of the country. This uneasy alliance would strengthen them against the looming threat from the West. The sovereignty of the nation was at stake and none of the options was very comforting. Oh Lord, what shall we do? The scenario I just described is based on fact. It could be taking place right now, almost anywhere in our world. And actually, it did. Only it was so long ago that it's not in any of our memory banks. I've just described for you, with a little poetic license, the political situation in the southern kingdom in the times of the Old Testament. The southern kingdom was also known as Judah, and it was in the time of King Ahaz and the prophet Isaiah. Judah was in a real quandary because the enemies were all around. Any alliance seemed to be an unholy one. And King Ahaz did not know which way to turn. And then enters the prophet Isaiah. His advice to the king, do not make political allies to save the nation. Turn instead to God. Isaiah, whose prophetic ministry lasted for more than 40 years, saw the political map of the world change dramatically during this time. Crisis followed crisis. And toward the close of Isaiah's ministry, he saw Ju Judah's foolish attempts to conspire against Assyria. Through all of these crises, the prophet maintained that an alliance against Assyria was a covenant 
with death. Now, Isaiah was not a political analyst, but in the historical arena where nations vied for power, he discerned the activity of Yahweh. Yahweh, who was the sovereign of Israel and the nations. And Isaiah's task as prophet to the nations was to interpret what Yahweh was saying and doing through this tense political event of the time. Ahaz was a, in a tough political spot. He'd come to the throne of Judah in one of the gravest crises of Judean history. The situation was desperate. Their options were to choose between accepting defeat or to appeal to the outside for help. And it is just at that moment that Isaiah confronts Ahaz and the message is very simple. Trust in Yahweh, keep quiet, stay calm. The appropriate response to the crises was faith. Isaiah saw the crises in a wider and a deeper perspective than mere diplomacy and fortifications. The perspective was the sovereign activity of God to shape the events. Now you can just imagine how that advice went over. Actually, you read, we read it on the screen and it said, Ahaz refused and said he did not want to put the Lord to the test. Let's transpose the scene to today. We look at the Oval Office. There's the president with a cabinet. And in comes a very powerful, well-known, evangelical-type preacher, you know, TV, maybe Joel Osteen or something like that. And he tries to offer this kind of advice to the president. And you can hear him saying, with all due respect, Reverend, you take care of souls, and I'll look out for the nation. So the historical fact is that Isaiah's prophecy is ignored. The alliance that Judah makes with these other allies, it turns on the country and it invades them. And that is the very beginning of the exile. And we know how deeply imprinted and how deeply devastating the exile was for the people of God. And so it is this situation and given the uh, decisions made that instead of being shored up and being uh, surrounded by um, people who were going to be allies with Judah, what we have is lots of machinations and political maneuvering and we have the very beginning of the end. Consider for a minute what Isaiah has asked of Ahaz and therefore of all the people. He asks, place, he asks of them to place their trust and their faith in God. He asks them to align with heavenly sources as opposed to the earthly powers. He tries to get them to understand that salvation is from God. You know, it's funny how when you read it and you say, oh, that, yeah, that, okay. But then, you know, you, you look at the real reality of life and situations and you see how quickly we all say, no, I refuse. I'm not going to put God to the test. You know, we're all facing all sorts of evil predicaments every day all around the world. There are terrorist cells. There are bombings, there are beheadings, there are burnings. 
And I think underlying it all is our fear of who will be next and where will it happen. I mean, a lady sitting on the beach, Rhode Island, suddenly something goes off, it blows her six feet into the air, she lands under rocks, who knows? Can we ever be safe again? And where is our sense of security and consolation? And then we look even a little deeper and we have to ask, what's our purpose? Why are we here? When you look at all of that out there. And scripture tells us for everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in God. We find our purpose in God. To give it a little clearer perspective, I return to an old favorite of mine, which is The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. I don't believe everything he says in there, but some of it I, is, is pretty good. And he says that the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment. Now, if you've been someone who's been driven in life and you've had a purpose and you've seen to know where to go and it all fell into place, this sounds like um, mush. But if you've ever struggled over what it is you were supposed to do, what you were supposed to do to be useful, to be authentic, to be a person of faith, this makes sense. This, is, this particular sentence, I believe, is at the very beginning of his book. And when I read it, I was like, wow. It's far greater than my own personal fulfillment. Everywhere we turn, we're hearing about follow your dreams. Just stick with it. You'll make it. If, if you, you try hard enough, it'll come to you. Lots of that is very important, you know, on a certain level, especially as the world, the women's uh, soccer world champions have been going around and talking and, you know, just speaking publicly. Their message to all the young children is that get out there and do it. You can do it. And that is very important. We're not going to deny that or dismiss it. It's very important that we have that underlying sense that as an individual, we are important in, this, in our role in the world. But it goes beyond that. It goes way beyond what I want for me. I need to step back and say, what does God want for me? What am I supposed to be doing? And I suspect that, you know, that's come across your mind one or two times in a lifetime. We were born by God's purpose and for God's purpose. And the search for the purpose of life has, puzzled, has puzzled people for thousands of years. And it's puzzled us because we typically begin at the wrong starting point. We begin with ourselves. We ask self-centered questions and we proceed in a self-centered manner. Scripture tells us that it is God who directs the lives of God's creatures. Everyone's life is in God's power. What if we all made a priority of determining that God is our origin, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and our destiny? that any other path is a dead end. You know, many people try to use God for their own self-actualization, 
and that's a reversal of nature, and it's doomed to failure. Scripture reveals that obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out and into the open, into a spacious and free life. And as I said, well, you know, you can find any kind of a self-help book that you want in the bookstores. Some are predictable, some are not. But in any event, they can lead you to great success. You can be exceedingly successful. But being successful and fulfilling your life's purposes are not the same thing. You could reach all of your personal goals and become a raving success by the world's standards and still miss the purposes for which God created you. Sometimes that's hard to digest, but again, these I see a running theme throughout my sermons the last month or so in which I've been talking about how we need to switch things around and how we have put certain things first and others second and they need to switch. Well, here's again another example. You can be successful and godly as well. But we're not supposed to be lifting up just the success because success is fleeting, and we need that which grounds us and sustains us and keeps us healthy inside, and that is our connectedness to God. A philosophy professor at Northeastern once wrote to 250 of the best-known philosophers scientists, writers, and intellectuals in the world, and he asked them, what is the meaning of life? And then he published all their responses in a book. Now, some of them offered best guesses, some admitted that they made it all up, and others were clueless. And interestingly enough, a number of them asked prof the professor to write back and tell them if he had discovered the purpose of life. Isaiah says to us, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The good news in all of this is that God was thinking of us long before we ever thought about God. And the purpose of our lives fits into a much larger cosmic purpose that God has designed for all eternity. Andrei Bitov, the Russian novelist, grew up under atheistic communist communist regime. But God got his attention one dreary day while he was riding the metro in Leningrad, which is again St. Petersburg. And he says, I was overcome with a despair so great that life seemed to stop at once, preempting the future entirely, let alone any meaning, suddenly all by itself, a phrase appeared to him. And you know who else was on a train riding into the distance when God approached her and told her to go to work with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta? Mother Teresa. And so this Russian novelist in the same vein, riding on a train, so watch out if you get on a train. <laughs> Never know who's going to approach you. The phrase that appeared to Bitoff was, without God, life makes no sense. 
And so he kept repeating it. And to his astonishment, he kept thinking about that phrase like it was a moving staircase. And he got out of the metro and he walked into God's light. Now, interestingly enough, I'm looking over the little brochure that we get every week in the uh, bulletin, the daily, the weekly devotional that we have. And I flip it over and it says, my life's purpose, you know, and I'm like, ah, what is going on here? Because here's another insight. And you read it today, you'll find it in there. The prayer, though, I thought was so appropriate that I want to share that with you. The prayer says, help me to remember that my main goal in life is to live as you created me to live within the divine will for my life. There it is. I could have just said that to you and skipped the whole sermon. Help me as I try, Lord. Help me to remember that my main goal in life is to live as you created me to live within the divine will for my life. Help me as I try, Lord. Amen. And so I ask you, have you felt in the dark about your purpose in life? Come, let us walk into the light. Amen.